share some work in progress today. I'm an architect, and I and my collaborators, Rob Gorbett, Rachel Armstrong, and many other colleagues, are working on a project called the Hylozoic Ground Project. Now, Hylozoic is an ancient word, which means life from material. And this is a beautiful word that speaks much about how we're working. We're trying to create a new responsive architecture, working bit by bit with materials and systems and interactive computing and new chemistry in order to try to create an architecture which might be responsive, perhaps an architecture which might know about us and might care about us, perhaps an architecture which might start in very primitive ways to be alive. Here's a first image of the Hylozoic Ground Project. It's a great immersive meshwork that surrounds you and which is fitted out with kinetic actuators and microprocessors. It breathes around you like a great lung. This kind of architecture starts in very basic ways. Perhaps it starts with a sense of a relationship with the ground. Perhaps the Canadian ground, that delicious sense of standing on the Canadian soil, of the deep magma underfoot of the Canadian shield, the sense of being rooted, of the reliable nature which is underfoot. And architecture in this kind of world might have a great filter around your body, around perhaps cities, serving as a kind of a filtering mediator, bringing the environment in, perhaps amplifying our own, our, our own feelings and our, our own communities. And yet, that kind of certainty of working with the existing ground today seems so very faint. I'm not standing on solid, solid ground right now. I'm standing on a, a shallow stage, and underfoot is a basement, and the kind of suspended slabs which make up our city make all of our bodies a little bit tense when we stand. We're standing on hollow ground. In fact, we're standing on a fragile world that increasingly seems to need great deal of stewardship, a great deal of care in order to create the ground again, in order to create a viable world. This is the start of a kind of responsive architecture. The first steps towards this rest in the scaffolding system itself, the kind of lightweight structures that are spun around that you see in this image. These are hyperbolic meshworks, which are very simple, small elements which are spun together using digital fabrication and then they clip together and they make curving, very lightweight networks, lace works, that serve as a kind of wall and ceiling and column work that can support a new architecture. And then populating this kind of work is a garden-like element of chemical compounds, little glands and traps and needles and breathing pores which serve like the al alveoli of your lung in order to bring oxygen through and, de and deliver nutrients and, and, flu and fluids, much like a garden works, a kind of living exchange that, ser that serves to, to populate this kind of architecture and make it live and breathe around us. And its architecture starts with very simple building blocks. In fact, perhaps the building block itself, the most basic building block of this architecture, is a sense of a touch, a change, an offering of a hand reaching out and small elements, small mechanisms reaching back that know you are there. These kind of individual building blocks are fitted out with proximity sensors. They can sense your presence, and then they reach back, and, 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 they, and they move and curl around you. And these elements, then, are, are, are fitted out with kinetic actuators and microprocessors. And let me show you one of these building blocks a little bit closer. Here's one of the columns that populates the space of Hylozoic ground. It's made of transparent uh, meshwork, which is digitally fabricated, individual little links that clip together. And here is a, an ind individual frond which knows that I'm here. It has a proximity sensor at the bottom here. It's moved by a little muscle wire which is stretching up and up al along this sled. And here, I can move this and it contracts with a tiny bit of electricity, very much like the, the strands of protein move your own muscles in your, in your body. It's not very strong, so it needs to be amplified with leverage, 
and, and, and with ad additional elements. And so then when I, when I operate it, it starts to move back just in very, very simple ways. And so these small fragile elements are the way that we start to spin together this sensitive responsive architecture. Using this kind of approach, we start to work with materials not in order to make them strong and static, but rather to stretch them out right at the very edge of their ability to span. Small pores that can stir air and, and del deliver motion all around you that are cut and, and fissured deeply, not so that, they're, that they, they are strong and firm, but rather so that they tremble, so that they're very near their edge of the collapse. With this kind of motion, these things become much more responsive and sensitive. The basic feeling of being in this kind of environment at first is a one of great quiet and calm. The meshwork stretches around you, small bits of motion emerge. The sense is that great capillary and convecti convective loops of air are swirling around you very gently, and small breathing pores start to reach out and start to deliver air up and down around you. The individual elements can sense you and reach back and touch, and a sense of a mutual exchange emerges in, in the room. You can see that individual elements sense your presence, and at the same time, this set of, of elements is also interacting between its own organization. You're not the only actor in the room. In fact, it's really taking care of itself at the same time. You become aware of glands and traps and whiskers that are trembling and exchanging in the atmosphere. There are bladders that have salts that pull fluids in, harvesting the humidified air. There are needles and glands and traps that are, that are building on the kind of nutrients that you deliver. In fact, in very simple ways, you are the environment's food, as well as it's serving you. The environment is fitted out with a meshwork of microprocessors, Arduino microprocessors, that have a communication system that travels between them so that individual signals are, are traded back and forth. There are individual elements of, of whiskers which respond to your presence and stir the air and tr trickle the, the, the nutrients through the system. There's a slightly dark sense of emotion in this environment as well, as a very gentle nurturing sense, because some of the elements are there quite explicitly for their own agenda. They are like germs, that is, they, they reach out and they grab you they, in, in, in very gentle ways. They pinch and pull and have exchanges so that they have their own nutrition, their own kind of ecology that they build in the system. It's a very simple ecology, that is, of, of water and salt and digestive fluids. But the basic sense of, of this environment then is one of a very curious kind of mutual exchange in which I can tell that it's serving me and at the same time it's receiving me. And I'd like to show you a few more images of this work in progress of where, where this is going past the Hylozoic project. In Copenhagen this last year, a great cloud-like element start, started to be, pu be put out where we had different strata with very di diffuse material that, are, that was delivering air through the space. And we also had a ground layer, a kind of geotextile, a textile that made up a new, gr new ground layer, fitted out with chemical nutrients below in order to set up a very fertile environment of exchange between air and ground. The endothelium project expanded the sense of ground by developing its own sense of organic power with it within the geotextile. This great meshwork was founded on chemistry that had tiny little bits of electricity inside every single cell. Here we can see it, and these individual cells are very much like lemon clocks or potato batteries that you might have made in your science class. Here, they're powering tiny little motors which bristle and move porcupine-like quills on the ends of, of the tripod stalks. And so this entire system is burrowing into the ground, trying to find its own, its own roots. There are yeast-like spores that spring out and, and build a new living turf out of this system. So it's a robotic ground-making kind, kind of sculpture. And in the very latest uh, ed edition of this work, which is now going to Venice, protocells are being incubated in a series of flasks. Here we can see one inside one of the breathing nests that we are, are now working on with Rachel Armstrong and their collaborators. 
Here's a video which we can, where we can see the protocells at work. These are not living cells. They are inorganic cells, but they show some strikingly lifelike features, shedding skins, regenerating themselves, making these ferrous mats and, and tails, which might serve to offer a way of building in the future. And beyond the extraordinary chemistry of this kind of system, there's a very curious kind of emotional response that I must admit that I feel when I work with this, with, with, with this material. How's it doing? Is that little one okay? It's looking after its mother there. Can I take care of it? That kind of emotional exchange is something we're actually trying to capture quite directly. Here in, in this video, you can see some primitive emotional patterns that we're fitting out throughout the work. In this, we're building on quite precise patterns of neurology in which nonverbal communication is exploited. That is, patterns of body language, such as if we move quickly, we seize up and we feel a bit of a spasm or convulsion in our muscles. If we move very gently, a receptor, a sensor field might interpret that as benign and want to come to reach us. And here we can see this environment alternating in, in its responses to me as I move through it, sensing my movement it, with proximity sensors. Alternately, it's very nervous because I'm, tr I'm com coming at it. And then alternately, it, m it moves very gently in, in, in benign waves. In fact, it's hiccuping and, and it's very ambivalent. I feel really kind of guilty uh, bec beca because of the way it can't make up its mind and the way I'm torturing it with my, with my actions. This sense of the possibility of, the, of these materials acquiring a sense of life and response gives us great hope in a responsive architecture. And I spoke about architecture as being a kind of filter, and I spoke about an ambivalence about trying to make the surface of the earth, trying to build a new fertility. This results in a rather sensitive kind of mutual exchange in which the environment might care about us and we might be able to participate in an environment in a kind of an exchange rather than a human mastery. Let me offer three final images that, that speak about particular qualities of this architecture. It starts with very familiar, very ordinary, perhaps ver ver very, uh, very close to home sensations. When I was little, I had a banky. In fact, it was before that I knew I was a person that I had a banky. And the American psychologist Don Winnicott tells me that this is a transitional object, that these kind of elements actually fuse with their own physiology, and we have a kind of composite identity with them, much like a dog that has with their bone. This kind of relationship in which we are not necessarily single people, but rather profound overlaps happen between things, promises much for the, for the example of a responsive architecture. Frangelico's studio in 1450 painted this great glittering veil, which also is a wonderful picture of how this responsive architecture might, might play. It's a filter, it surrounds the body, it, it reaches out and it draws in the surroundings and it's made bit by bit, crochet loop by crochet loop, embro embroidery and, and, and sequins and formative geometry in a very ordinary and straightforward material way so building up from simple actions, it becomes possible to make a complex, very sensitive environment. Now this religious picture here by, by Grunewald, who painted it in 1525, is not simply a mystic picture of power. It's also a precisely scientific uh, pi picture at its time of the operations in light and energy. And Grunewald was painting, I think, something very close to the way this responsive architecture might work in the future. That is, if we can increasingly understand the boundaries around each of our bodies, the, chemi the chemistry that goes into our exchanges, the thermal exchanges that occur around the walls and windows of buildings, then those kinds of, of, of states might be the physical medium that architects in the future start to work with in addressing and manipulating and fulfilling a responsive architecture. This is not simply a mystic state, but it's a precisely defined set of octaves and energy states which we can increasingly manipulate in this kind of work. And so I hope that these kind of strategies, the set of digital fabricated elements in which we go through many cycles of design and make lightweight elements, fitting it out with, with microprocessors, 
fitting out with, with chemistry that starts to offer something of living systems and then working with empathetic and emotional systems in the behavior loops that we fit it out with might offer some paths, some strategies towards achieving a future architecture which, which is responsive. Thank you.